Deleuze's Difference and Repetition by Joe Hughes. Chapter 2 Overview of Themes Representing the World, the Other Structure. In the previous chapter, I proposed a concrete definition of representation. By representation, Deleuze means the object considered from the point of view of its two distinctive traits, quality and extensity. This assemblage characterizes an individual object of perception. But only in books on philosophy do we ever confront an individual object, self-contained and independent of its surrounding world. Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty, among others, continually criticized philosophy for choosing such a bad example, the standalone object, to illustrate the intuitive or perceptual act. The individual object set off from the world is an abstraction. What is primary and immediate is an object embedded within a context, which gives that object its sense, its importance, its relation to other objects, its inseparability from our actions and its potential uses, and so on. As Husserl put it, each object is surrounded by a, quote, halo of potentialities. This results in what we call the, quote, essential contradiction harbored by every perception. Quote, external perception is a constant pretension to accomplish something that, by its very nature, it is not in a position to accomplish, close quote. Every perception tends towards unity, towards a finished product. But at the same time, that unity is dissolved into a horizon of, quote, potentialities or, quote, virtualities. Quote, proper to every appearing thing of each perceptual phase is a new empty horizon, a new system of determinable indeterminacy, a new system of progressing tendencies with corresponding possibilities of entering into determinately ordered systems of possible appearances, close quote. Every appearing thing is embedded within a, quote, system of determinable indeterminacy, these determinable indeterminacies are called, quote, potentialities or, quote, virtualities. Here Husserl draws attention to the fact that these potentialities structure the field of transcendental experience or, quote, pure imminence. The halo of potentialities forms a, quote, determinately ordered system through which we try to anticipate what will come next in the order of appearances. Quote, there is a constant process of anticipation, of pre-understanding, close quote. In the Cartesian meditations, Husserl will say that, quote, every actuality involves its potentialities, which are not empty possibilities, but rather possibilities intentionally pre-delineated in respect of content, close quote. Because this system forms an open but determinate totality, bracket, end quote, idea in the Kantian sense, close bracket, and because it structures the appearance of every object, Husserl will call it the, quote, idea of the world. Husserl obviously was not the first to point out that every determinate perception is surrounded by a halo of potentialities. We see similar accounts in James or in Bergson's, quote, creative evolution. One could even point all the way back to Leibniz, whose petite perceptions swarm imperceptibly around any larger perception and provide its, con its contextual backdrop. If we single out Husserl then, it is because Deleuze directly takes up several important aspects of Husserl's description of this phenomenon when he develops his theory of the quote, other. Deleuze briefly introduces the idea of the quote, other at the end of difference and repetition. But the significance of the concept extends far beyond the number of lines devoted to it. What Deleuze says in these pages is highly derivative of an essay published a year earlier, quote, Michel Tournier and the world without others, close quote. And to fully understand the concept, it will be necessary to turn briefly to that essay. In Difference and Repetition, Deleuze says two things about the other. The first sounds deeply Husserlian, quote, in every psychic system, there is a swarm of possibilities around a reality, but our possibilities are always others, close quote. In the Tournier essay, he calls these, quote, possibles by their Husserlian name, quote, potentialities or virtualities, 
There he describes this first function of the other as follows. Quote, Around each object that I perceive, or each idea that I think, there is the organization of a marginal world, a mantle or background, where other objects and other ideas may come forth in accordance with laws of transition which regulate the passage from one to another. Close quote. Like Husserl's idea of the world, the other structure envelops any perceived object in a swarm of potentialities which allow the transition from one object to another. In fact, Deleuze even calls this structure by its Husserlian name, quote, the structure of the world. The quote, other, Deleuze is talking about, is therefore not another echo. What is only a potentiality for me, the backside of a chair, for example, is an actuality for the other person standing behind the chair. What is other, or are the potentialities of the current reality that swarm around that reality? The second thing Deleuze says about the other structure in Difference and Repetition is that it is, quote, expressive. Quote, the other cannot be separated from the expressivity which constitutes it, close quote. Each perceived object is connected to the, quote, expressivity which constitutes that object. How and by what means is the object constituted? What is this expressivity? That is the question which difference and repetition as a whole provides an answer to. Ultimately, Deleuze will say that the object is constituted by the idea, and the idea by the passive synthesis. This point of view brings to light a second sense of the word, quote, other. It refers back to lower strata of consciousness. From consciousness of the object, we move back to the idea, and from the idea, we move back to an evanescent materiality which is given to our sensibility. All three of these movements, matter, idea, and representation, are part of one and the same subject. Even if the other structure is what encloses, quote, individuating factors and pre-individual singularities within the limits of objects and subjects, which are then offered to representation as perceivers or perceived, close quote, it still testifies to the persistence of these lower strata in representation. Before turning to Deleuze's account of the genesis of the object, however, it is necessary to address his use of language throughout difference and repetition. Indirect discourse. Perhaps the most difficult aspect of difference in repetition is not the complexity of the thought, but the mode of expression. It is extremely rare that Deleuze ever says anything directly, instead approaching everything through a detour. This is not specific to difference in repetition. His entire oeuvre, from empiricism and subjectivity to pure imminence, is composed in free indirect discourse. In fiction, Free indirect discourse is a narrative technique which allows the thoughts of a character to emerge more directly. It gives the reader a sense of unmediated access to the consciousness of the character, and it is usually accomplished through a blurring of the first and third person. As Genet puts it, the character's speech becomes mixed with the narrative's speech. Behold, for example, Stefan Daedalus as he picks his nose on the beach, quote, He laid the dry snot picked from his nostril on the rock carefully. For the rest, let look who will. Behind. Perhaps there is someone. His face turned over his shoulder, rare regardant. Moving through the air, high spars of a three-master. Her sails brailed up on the cross trees, homing upstream, silently moving a silent ship. Close quote. Joyce. The first sentence is the third person. Quote, he laid the dry snot. But the next three, without warning, enter into Stefan's thoughts. Joyce doesn't say in simple, indirect discourse, something like, quote, Stefan wondered whether someone had seen him pick his nose, but at that very moment he told himself he didn't care, he sensed someone behind him, and felt compelled to turn around and look, close quote. Instead, Joyce transitions from the third-person narrative of the first sentence into the first person freely or without any indication, quote, for the rest, look who will, behind, perhaps there is someone, close quote. Directly following this, 
Again, without any indication, we return to the third person. Joyce's narrator tells us that Stefan, retreating from his confident indifference, looks over his shoulder but sees only a passing ship. The words of the narrator and the thoughts of the character blur together, and it is often difficult to tell, especially in Joyce, where one leaves off and the other begins. In Deleuze's own words, quote, the author takes a step towards his characters, but the characters take a step towards the author, double becoming, close quote. This narrative technique becomes particularly important in an author for whom the history of philosophy is a series of stories. Throughout his lectures, Deleuze repeatedly says things like, quote, assume that I'm telling you a story, or, quote, let's approach this like a story. Quote, it matters li little whether you've read Spinoza or not, for I'm telling a story, close quote. Everything is a story for Deleuze. There is the story of the eternal return, the story of the cockatoo, of the white wall differing only intensity, of time, of analytic truths, and so on. Quote, I will do the story of reflective judgment on request, close quote, or, quote, I will try to clarify this story of faculties, close quote. Deleuze will say the same thing of this book. The logic of sense is a, quote, logical and psychological novel. Difference in repetition is a, quote, detective novel, mixing elements of, quote, science fiction. For a number of reasons, then, his books should be read as novels rather than as philosophical tomes. What is at issue in each is the narration of a story. In the case of difference in repetition, the story is rather bland. It is the story of the genesis of representation. But the important point for now is simply that all of these stories are written in the mode of free and direct discourse. When Deleuze uses free and direct discourse within the context of a philosophical work, the relation stays the same. There is still a double becoming or an indiscernible mixture of first and third person. But what counts as first and third person has changed. It is no longer a question of narrator and character. Deleuze's authorial voice now fills the role of narrator, while the place of the character is usually filled by another author. His earlier books on figures in the history of thought worked in this way. It is often impossible to tell in Nietzschean philosophy, for example, whether it is Deleuze or Nietzsche speaking, and it has become a frequent complaint that Deleuze critics rarely wonder who is speaking and simply quote Deleuze on Nietzsche as though it were a straightforward Deleuze. Even when a reader as sensitive as Alain Badou recognizes that everything is indirect, it still doesn't prevent him from constantly equating Deleuze's comments on Foucault to Deleuze's own thoughts on a subject. We could ask this question for all of Deleuze's works. Where does Proust start and Deleuze end? What is Deleuzean and what is Bergsonian in Bergsonism? It is because he merges the speaking subject and the object of that speech so gracefully that we can never tell where Deleuze is Deleuze and not Hume, Proust, or Nietzsche. In the preface to the English edition of Difference and Repetition, Deleuze says that there, quote, is a great difference between writing history of philosophy and writing philosophy, close quote. And he suggests that this is the first book in which he, quote, tried to do philosophy and to, quote, speak in his own name. But it is hard to take him seriously for a simple reason, bracket, besides the fact that he says the opposite in the last paragraph of the original preface, close bracket, Deleuze still doesn't speak in his own name. The whole of difference and repetition unfolds within the context of either elaborate metaphors or of interpretive paraphrases of other thinkers, which indirectly develop and express what Deleuze would claim to say directly. Throughout difference and repetition, Deleuze employs free indirect discourse in the same way that he did in his earlier works. His exposition of the three syntheses takes place entirely under the cover of Hume, Bergson, Nietzsche, Kant, Freud, Lacan, Husserl, and physics. Nowhere does he speak directly. When he speaks of ideas, he does so by talking about mathematics and the dice throws of Nietzsche and Mellamé. When he speaks of intensity, it is through the vocabulary of, nine, the vocabulary of 19th century energetics. What parts of his descriptions of eternal return pertain to Nietzsche and what parts to Deleuze? When Deleuze speaks of Kant's rejection of the Cartesian cogito, is he speaking of himself or Kant? 
in difference and repetition <clears throat> if difference and repetition is composed in free and direct discourse we can already see that the worst thing we could do would be to read it literally or to treat indirect statements as direct statements Deleuze doesn't develop a philosophy of biology of differential calculus or of contemporary physics his criticisms of Plato Descartes and others are not arguments that would benefit greatly from being followed out and justified in more direct prose. There is no doubt that it is essential to see the degree to which Deleuze engages with other philosophers either critically or apologetically, bracket, and in particular with Kant, close bracket. But we have to keep in mind that ultimately Deleuze is telling a story, and these extended metaphors, minor engagements, and short polemics are nothing but indices of a larger structure, which is what really animates the book. History and language. Perhaps even more important than the fact that Deleuze makes use of free and direct discourse is the reason why he uses it. This decision to write indirectly is one of the most important and fundamental aspects of Deleuze's thought, and it would require a much broader and more detailed presentation than I can provide here. Even so, we can point to two reasons why Deleuze makes use of free and direct discourse. The first concerns the question of historical influence raised by Heidegger. One refrain that occurs throughout Heidegger's work is the claim that history is not something that is exclusively past, but which still exerts an immense and unseen influence on us in the present. Quote, People still hold the view that what is handed down to us by tradition is what in reality lies behind us, while in fact it comes toward us because we are its captives and destined to it, close quote, what is called thinking. We are the captives of history even as, and especially when, we think we have put it behind us. This notion is behind Heidegger's famous concept of, quote, destruction, which he elaborated in Being in Time, quote, that sign is not only entangled in the world, at the same time, that sign is also entangled in a tradition which it more or less explicitly grasps. This tradition deprives that sign of its own leadership in questioning and choosing. The tradition that hereby gains dominance makes it, quote, makes what it, quote, transmits so little accessible that initially, and for the most part, it covers it over instead. What has been handed down, it hands over to obviousness. It bars access to what original, quote, wellsprings, out of which the traditional categories and concepts were, in part, genuinely drawn, close quote, being in time. We are entangled in history. And we don't even know it because what we unconditionally accept has been handed down to us as, quote, obvious. These comments have an obvious target, Husserl. Husserl had claimed that by means of the phenomenological reduction, by means of a turn to transcendental experience itself, he was able to find a radically new beginning for philosophy. In a lecture course given just before the publication of Being in Time, and containing roughly the first half of that work almost unaltered, we see Heidegger taking issue with Husserl on just this point. Quote, Even phenomenological research stands under the constraints of an old tradition, especially when it comes to the most primordial determination of the theme most proper to it, intentionality. Contrary to its most proper, proper principle, therefore, phenomenology defines its most proper thematic matter not out of the matters themselves, but instead out of a traditional prejudgment of it, albeit one that has become quite self-evident. What shows itself in the neglect of the primary questions of being as such is rather the force and weight of the tradition to a degree which cannot be easily overestimated." Close quote. History of the concept of time. The unseen, quote, force and weight of the tradition, close quote, has caused phenomenology to prejudge what is, quote, most proper to it, the description of transcendental experience. Husserl doesn't attend to the matter itself. He makes a traditional prejudgment of it. Heidegger is extending the breadth of the reduction. Whereas Husserl bracketed the natural attitude, Heidegger brackets history. He does so in two forms. First, he wants to avoid importing what he calls, quote, theoretical, 
presuppositions. These are presuppositions that, for example, tell us before we even look at consciousness what consciousness is, rationality, numerical unity across different spaces and times, and so forth. But second, and more importantly for the French reception of Heidegger, is the question of philosophical language itself. Heidegger continually draws attention to the way in which a philosophical vocabulary brings with it theoretical presuppositions. We see both theory and language come under scrutiny in this passage. Quote, Before we summarize the significance of categorical intuition and secure its positive scope for ourselves, we should first correct certain misunderstandings which easily creep into the phenomenological character of categorical intuition. This happens all the more readily because this discovery is itself obtained in a traditional horizon of inquiry and interpreted with traditional concepts. Close quote. History. Both the traditional theoretical horizon as well as the traditional philosophical concepts must be bracketed. Only after this double reduction has Heidegger secured to his satisfaction a legitimate access to the experience of being. This tendency for language to carry with it an entire set of historical and theoretical presuppositions is only one aspect of the need to invent a new philosophical discourse. Claire Colbrook em emphasizes a second, more Nietzschean reason. The very structure of language imposes itself on what we talk about. Quote, our subject slash predicate structures, or the very form of our logic, leads us to think of a being, substrate or ground, that then bears some predicate, close quote. Before the inquiry even begins, the subject is already determined as something that endures above and beyond its transitory predicates, and as Colebrook points out, one is therefore prevented in advance from affirming the original movement through which the subject itself is affected. All of these points come across quite clearly in an opposition between, quote, wakeful consciousness and the, quote, corporeal corporealizing thought of the body that Pierre Klosowski draws in Nietzsche and the Vicious Circle. Klosowski describes the body as a mobile field of, quote, intensities and, quote, changing excitations. For various reasons, our wakeful consciousness rarely experiences and lives the intensities of the body. One of these reasons is that consciousness is coextensive with language, or what Klosowski calls the, quote, code of everyday signs. Language has its own logic and its own set of relations, and it imposes its, quote, own linkages in order to conceal the total discontinuity of our lived state, close quote. This poses no problems until we want to study the lower depths of consciousness or, quote, affirm the authenticity of life in an intelligible manner, close quote. We then realize that it is impossible to speak of intensity and becoming precisely because, quote, we have no language to express what is in becoming, close quote. Language imposes its own connections onto, be, onto becoming. Every time we try to talk about it, we turn it into a noun, or give it a meaning, or turn it into an intelligible thought. Everyday language, quote, never allows us to speak of our own unintelligible depth, except by ascribing to what is neither thought, nor said, nor willed, a meaning and an aim that we think according to language, close quote. For this reason, Maurice Blanchot speaks of the inherent, quote, falsity of all direct discourse, close quote. Deleuze will make a point that is very similar to Klosowski's, Klosowski's in his cinema books. The phenomenological reduction has to be extended to language. It is not enough to only guard against the tendencies of perception. Language itself turns becoming into bodies. Quote, quote, Indeed, our perception and our language distinguish bodies, bracket nouns, qualities, bracket adjectives, and actions, bracket verbs. But actions, in precisely this sense, have already replaced movement with the idea of a provisional place towards which it is directed or that of a result that it secures. Quality has replaced movement with the idea of a state which persists whilst waiting for another to replace it. Body has replaced movement with the idea of a subject which would carry it out or of an object which would submit to it, 
of a vehicle which would carry it. We will see that such images are formed in the universe, but they depend on new conditions and certainly cannot appear for the moment. For the moment we only have movements which are called images in order to distinguish them from everything else that has not yet become." Close quote. Deleuze's goal is to think matter or movement independently of everything that it will later become, bodies, qualities, and actions. In order to do so, we not only have to bracket natural perception in which everything appears as an already constituted body, quality, or action, but we have to bracket natural language as well. The very word, quote, action, carries with it the provisional place towards which action is directed. The very word, quote, quality, carries with it the idea of a place which will bear that quality. The word, quote, body, carries with it the place of a subject. Determinate bodies, qualities, and actions will all be produced in the end thanks to the work of Genesis, bracket, and Cinema 1 and Cinema 2 are the story of this Genesis, close bracket. But, in order to define the foundations of that Genesis, and in order to grasp the movement of production, it is necessary to rigorously exclude any intimation of the destination of Genesis, whether that intimation comes from prejudices of natural perception or from the prejudices of natural language. Deleuze will develop all these points in Difference and Repetition in a short passage in which he opposes Nietzsche and Kierkegaard to Hegel. In all three thinkers, the goal was to grasp becoming movement or genesis. Hegel, however, still grasps movement from the standpoint of language, of identities and oppositions, and this in part because he remained content to simply represent movement rather than make us live it. Quote, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche are among those who bring to philosophy a new means of expression. Furthermore, in all their work, movement is at issue. Their objection to Hegel is that he does not go beyond false movement. In other words, the abstract logical movement of, quote, mediation. They want to put metaphysics in motion, in action. They want to make it act and make it carry out immediate acts. It is not enough, therefore, for them to propose a new representation of movement. Representation is already mediation. Rather, it is a question of producing within the, the work a movement capable of affecting the mind outside of all representations. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is a question of making movement itself a work, without interposition, of substituting direct signs for immediate representations, of inventing vibrations, rotations, whirlings, gravitations, dances, or leaps, which directly touch the mind. Close quote. What is striking about this passage is that, the, is that the objection to Hegel is not made on the level of concepts alone. It is addressed primarily to the way in which he chose to express these concepts. Bracket. And of course, the entire point of the passage is that the two are inseparable. Close bracket. Whereas Hegel represents becoming, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche bring to philosophy a new means of expression which produces becoming in the reader. In reading Nietzsche, one should experience the movement of thought. The writer no longer tries to represent the movement of thought, but to create the movement in the reader. Of course, we have to be careful because Deleuze is talking about Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, and not himself, and Deleuze's own style will go beyond this particular stylistic device. Two things, however, are clear. Direct discourse is discounted from the start. As soon as you directly represent thought in language, you have lost it. Deleuze therefore gives to philosophy an enormous aesthetic dimension. Logic is neither the object and concern of philosophy, nor is it its inescapable organon. Philosophy must make use of, quote, all the possibilities of language, close quote. In other words, it must become literature so that it can create movement. 
If everything worked as planned, Deleuze's readers would confront a meaningless and evanescent materiality, bracket, i.e., the text which would, would the text which few would deny is often quite meaningless, close bracket, and by repeating it, eventually extract a meaning and a determinate representation of the object. The reader would live the system and realize at the end of his or her work that that work was exactly what was being described the whole time. The second point, my spoiler warning, is simply that the idea of a reader's guide which attempts to bring the vibrations, rotations, and whirlings of difference and repetition into the dubious clarity of everyday language is, in fact, a fundamental betrayal of Deleuze's aesthetic project, and that perhaps by avoiding this process of sense-making, we have already missed the entire point of the book.